top Biden officials panic. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today in our lead story today. It's crisis mode is activated as you won't believe what the Biden administration just did. I'm going to show you what they did, who's behind this move, and why they're outright panicking as we have some new data that suggests the U.S. economy is now in far worse shape than the administration wants to believe. Plus, the Bank of Japan has done the unthinkable, I'll show you why it won't work, and a major country is on the edge of an all-out depression. We'll show you what the latest data means for them and why this is bad news for the rest of the world. Plus, we have a sponsor today's show. I'd like to welcome Thermabrite to the show. You can find them on the TSXV under the symbol THRM and on the OTCQB under the symbol TBRIF. And they are transforming innovation into wellness. And I'm going to show you a long-term play. If you're looking to generate a potential 5x or more return on your money, I'm going to show you how to buy at a level underneath the major executives and how they're highly motivated to generate a big return for you. Stay tuned to the end of the show or check out the pinned comment or description for more information. Now let's first head over to the Federal Reserve where we get an announcement on today's monetary policy as recent indicators suggest that economic activity has continued to expand at a solid pace. Job gains have moderated and the unemployment rate has moved up but remains low. Inflation have eased over the past year but remains somewhat elevated. Again, it's at 3% the target as we know the Fed wants it to get down to 2% and they remain unconvinced that it's going to get there and part of the reason they are is because the road down is bumpy until you're in an all-out recession and then it goes very quick quickly. The committee seeks to achieve maximum employment inflation at the rate of 2% over the longer run as the committee judges that the risk to achieving its employment and inflation goals continue to move into better balance. So what they're suggesting here is they don't mind that people are headed to the unemployment line. From the Fed's perspective, if you're out of work, they're A-OK -okay with it. What they don't want is too many people on the unemployment line. But for the moment, they believe we're in better balance. They note the economic outlook as uncertain and the committee is attentive to the risk to both sides of its dual mandate neither of which it can hope to achieve in support of its goals the committee decided to maintain the target range for the federal fund rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent and this was expected the market believed the fed was going to do this and what they didn't believe was what you're about to see in considering any adjustments to the target range for the federal fund rate, the committee will carefully assess incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risk, which it says are normalizing here. The committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it's gained greater confidence that the inflation target is moving sustainably toward 2%. And that is what nobody really thought would happen. The expectation here was the Fed would kind of suggest, and we talked about this on the show yesterday, by flying a trial balloon that they're actually looking at a possible cut in September if things get to target. Maybe the reason why is has everything to do with the bond market. As we look at the federal fund rate, while the Fed claims they really care about the labor market or inflation, what they really really care about what the market expectations are and that is a two-year treasury yield do you want to know where the funds rates going though the two-year will tell you exactly and here we can go back to 2006 and you can see the two-year treasury yield in red it dipped but it wasn't enough to convince the fed and in fact it rallied back up twice before two-year yields all out plunge and that gave the fed all the confidence it needed although too late to start cutting policy rates. And heading into pandemic, many people question why Fed Trump Powell cut rates. Not everything to do with two-year treasury yields. But look at this time. As far as the Fed's concerned, they didn't cut rates when two years suggested they do it the first time or the second time. And now they're not convinced the third time. But we do know by September, we're likely to see a complete change in the economy, and we'll show you why. But let's talk first about what the Biden administration just did and who's behind this move. Well, none other than Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. As U.S. plans to hold note bond sales steady for several quarters, but this is not the surprise move. What you're going to find out is the Biden administration is kind of going behind the scenes here to ease policy 
because who would know better about the Fed's move than a former Fed chair? That's right. Janet Yellen knows what the Fed does and knows they're trapped here. And she sees the economy weakening, is doing now everything in her power at the Treasury to ease financial conditions. The Treasury Department said in a statement on Wednesday it will sell $125 billion of securities at a so-called quarterly refunding auctions next week, which spans three 10 and 30-year maturities. Dealers have widely predicted that outcome, seeing the department is able to make up any funding shortfalls over the period via more bill sales. And this was the surprise, because based on the current projected borrowing needs, the Treasury does not anticipate needing to increase nominal coupon or floating rate note auction sizes for at least the next several quarters this is something that the market really was actually hoping for to try to create a catalyst to drive long-term yields lower many believe that the government would be forced to issue more debt now they're saying we're not going to question is why and what are they up to with all this bill issuance well you're about to be surprised and most of the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee members this time indicated that averaging around 20 percent over time this was where the issuance of T-bills comes into play it was a good trade-off between interest rate costs, volatility and financing, and the risk of rolling over a major amount of debt at one time. And here you can see the issues as Treasury bills as a share of U.S. debt are above the 20% target as the upper range. And this is unusual and is causing some people in the political space and the economic space to question the motivation of what's going on here with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Why is she doing this? Well, as you're about to find out, it's deliberately done to ease policy knowing the Fed can't. And with the Federal Reserve now having reduced the amount of treasuries it's letting mature each month, that's right, quantitative easing has now officially been scaled back without any expected replacement. That has in turn eased the burden on the Treasury to sell more debt to the public to fund the fiscal deficit. So while the Fed isn't lowering the funds rate, as we found out, we do know they went ahead and lowered their purchases or their sales, that is, of bonds to the public. And that has helped easing conditions. That was kind of the intent here. But the Treasury took it one step further as later Wednesday, the Fed is widely expected to signal will start lowering rates, but they didn't. In fact, the so-called pace of quantitative tightening, the amount of central bank is shrinking its balance sheet, is seen staying at the current amount of up to $25 billion a month for Treasuries, and there is no current expectation that's going to drop. But here we see on Wednesday's statement also detailed a new schedule buybacks. That's right. Yellen's buying back bonds for the August to October period. In May, after over a year of analysis, the Treasury launched a new buyback program, and now they're continuing it with the operation aimed for supporting market liquidity, or at least that's what they say. The Treasury said it plans to get on cash management buybacks in September of 2024. But what they're really doing here is they're issuing short-term T-bills to buy back long-dated treasuries, older treasuries. They're paying a lot less interest. They're trying to free up liquidity in the markets. But the other thing they're doing here is freeing up balance sheets, and they're also trying to ease financial conditions. And for good reason, because as we note, the Fed did not cut rates and did not expect to cut rates down in September, even though the market will still continue to price that in, there's a reason Janet Yellen is in panic mode. It has everything to do with the economy. As U.S. hiring and wage growth both slowed in ADP July data, as firms added 122,000 jobs, that's now the lowest since January, and missing expectations to the downside. But here's the critical part. As wage growth slowed to the smallest pace since 2021 for workers who changed jobs, as well as those who stayed, according to the data. Several industries cut jobs this month, led by professional services, information, and manufacturing. Most of the cuts were concentrated in small businesses of about 20 to 49 employees. And we've talked about this and we've seen in the National Federation of Independent Business reports in their surveys that they're indicating that small businesses were having trouble accessing credit. Of course, they also noted that demand for products and services were down. It was only a matter of time. They don't have the resources that much larger firm has, and now they're starting to cut jobs. This is a dangerous sign because as they cut jobs, watch, it goes upstream to the bigger companies. Companies. 
The ADP figures are consistent with signs of a gradual slowdown in hiring, as we saw that from the JOLT survey, which is largely made up, as joblessness has now been on the rise in recent months, as we look at continued unemployment claims, and so have the number of Americans applying for those benefits. Of course, we'll get updated data tomorrow, but let's take a look at this chart because it's important to understand that as employers cut hours and they don't give out as big of wage increases, well, it's because they don't need as many employees, and that means they send them to the unemployment line. Of course, there's also a demand component for employees. If you know you can go out to the labor market in terms of available workers, and they're plentiful, but you don't have to give those a have jobs, big raises. And sure enough, we can look at total compensation growth of average hourly earnings multiplied by average weekly hours of production and non-supervisory employees. This showed in blue on a year-on-year -year rate of change, and we're looking here against continued unemployment claims. So you can see that as employers start to pare back on hours worked and how much in wage increases they're giving out, what you see is continued unemployment claims rise, and that has a function of the fact that as people make less money, they end up spending less, particularly in a higher interest rate environment where their debt service cost goes up. And then on top of that, we've seen energy prices rise we're also seeing insurance costs go up and it's really hurting family budgets and that means less spending and more people to the unemployment line and we can see this typically leads into a recession as we see total compensation grow slowing going into the dot-com bubble as continued unemployment claims rose we see it happening again going into the global financial crisis and now we're seeing the early signs of this if there's one data point that i am concerned about and watching the most it's every thursday so it's continued unemployment claims because these central bankers have absolutely no clue what they're doing and they're driving the global economy slowly into a massive recession that's going to turn out to potentially be a global depression when you factor a fact that a lot of banks are hemorrhaging and upside down we're looking at a total financial crisis and the evidence that these central bankers have no clue what they're doing well no further than looking at japan as they're changing the rules, this according to Zero Hedge, as a bank of Japan shocks by hiking into a weakening economy to contain a crashing yen, and this is virtually unheard of. We don't see the central bankers make such policy moves because they normally care about the economy. Now, remember the last country that just did this, that was China. And what did they turn around and do? You got it. They cut rates because they knew they had to, and they gave up on their currency, something we expect will happen with the yen and Japan. The Bank of Japan has lifted its benchmark interest rate to a quarter percent, and has outlined plans to have its monthly bond purchases in a decisive, if yet doomed, move to normalize its monetary policy and contain inflation. And with the Fed and other central banks either set to move or already moving rapidly in the opposite direction, we know the ECB has and likely will in September. I still will go on record saying I believe the Fed will cut in September. The always confused Bank of Japan's shift to tighter policy will narrow an interest rate gap has driven record weakness in the yen, marking a big shift for global currency markets. And what they're hoping is this is going to bring money into their economy demand for their currency and their bonds instead of seeing money fly out of their country. The Japanese currency strengthened more than 1% following the decision on Wednesday, as everyone believes this is going to work, but hang tight, not for long. As we look to the senior economist at Moody's Analytics, he pointed to the BOJ's new emphasis on the yen's inflationary impact, but also that the central bank was still hiking into a weak economy in the absence of demand-driven inflation. And here's the challenge. The currency in a fiat currency, they're just reflective of demand for it. So the notion that they're going to see the yen stay higher is highly unlikely because their economy is weakening in Japan and the global economy is weakening as well, particularly the U.S. consumer, which is why we talked about that ADP report because it says spending here is dropping, which means, of course, exports out of Japan are going to go down and all in turn means that any hope to stabilize the yen is not going to work. Instead, what you're seeing here is a central bank driving their economy right back into a recession. I think the BOJ needs to be clear about the fact that they're changing the rules because they're not winning the game. In fact, well, central bankers tend not to. He forecasts the next rate increase would be in December, noting 
that the yen pressure on the BOJ was likely to wane once the Fed started cutting rates. I'll be surprised if they cut in December. I won't be surprised if they actually start to, that is cut rates in December, not hike. I'm gonna go the opposite direction here because look what's happening in China, the direct neighbor. As China home loan sales slump drags on despite the latest rescue effort indicating that the Chinese economy is heading to an all-out depression. Look at this, new home sales value slid 19.7% in July, now faster than in June. In fact, transactions have dropped 36.4% in June after showing a notable increase in April and May. We said it wouldn't hold, it would last, and that indeed is what we're seeing. The value of new home sales just plunging, and that is not good because we know that these home builders have a lot of loans to the banking system there in China. And of course, these banks are highly dependent on that. If the builders go, and it looks like they will, well, there goes the entire Chinese banking system all at once. The accelerating slide underscores how China's recent rescue package is falling short of expectations. Well, that is an understatement. Here you can see that Bloomberg Economics estimates that the central bank's $42 billion relending program can only help local governments purchase 0.8% of China's $60 billion unsold homes. I'm going to be surprised if they have that many unsold homes. I'm going to go with a typo on that one. But buyer sentiment has also been hurt since a twice-a-decade meeting of the ruling Communist Party fail to roll out more forceful support because again, it's all coming back to the fact they're afraid of the yuan dropping in value. But again, they can't see it's everything to do with the economy. The answer is they need to stimulate, get people to spend. The problem is no one around the world is spending enough to keep things afloat. And meanwhile, what we find out now is China's factory activity shrinks again, now for the third straight month, in a hit to growth as a sign again that the global economy here continues to weaken. The official Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index hit 49.4, according to the National Bureau of Statistics. The number matched economists' forecast was slightly worse than June's reading at 49.5. The gauge has stayed below the 50 mark, separating growth from contraction for all but three months since April of 2023. And the services side or non-manufacturing measure of activity in construction and services fell to 50.2, indicating it's just slightly in expansion, but very slightly. These PMIs contribute to evidence of weak growth in China, which we already know based on just their currency alone. Domestic consumption is weak, whereas the exports are also facing headwinds from external markets, evident by the fact that U.S. consumers are tapped out. And this is all being displayed in the commodity markets, as Bloomberg notes that here the commodity spot index goes negative on year amid China's faltering economic recovery as the Bloomberg Commodity Spot Index has wiped out all gains so far this year. After peaking in late May, the index quickly slipped into negative territory by July. If you wanna look for future opportunities, well, one place will be the commodity market, but if you're looking for a long-term play, then look no further than Thermobrite. You can find them on the TSXV, under symbol THRM, and on the OTCQB, under symbol TBRIF. And as we said, they're transforming innovation into wellness. But let's take a look at Thermobrite and the incredible long-term opportunity here because they are a developer and partner in a range of leading edge proprietary diagnostic and medical device technologies. And here we can see from a recent press release, Thermobrite's VenoWave VW5 secures FDA 510K approval. And this is a huge deal for the company because they are now pleased to announce that they've received the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's approval on its 510 application request to correct the VenoWave VW5 device's intended use labeling and description. This approval addresses the U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services requirement for issuing the VenoWave VW5 permanent current procedural terminology and healthcare common procedure coding system. But let's take a look at why this matters because the FDA's 510K application approval, as well as the CMS pricing and new HCPS level two code designation recommendations and review process being complete, the company expects VenoWave's permanent codes approval 
imminently. And our distribution partners are standing ready to begin the work to deploy our Vino Wave to their network of Medicare and Medicaid medical practitioners, which will drive business to help their patients with a variety of circulatory issues, including deep vein thrombocytosis and pulmonary embolism at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, estimates over 900,000 U.S. citizens are impacted by every year. And let's take a look at their second quarter update as their medical device developer and investors taps four markets with growth projections of 39.1 billion by 2023. And this would be massive for the company and given its current stock price trading right around one and a half cents as a time of filming. I'm gonna show you how this is an incredible long-term opportunity to pick up some shares as the executives here are highly motivated to transform this company and drive the stock price significantly higher, which could generate a potential five X or more return. In March of this year, the company announced it was conducting a strategic review, which aimed at evaluating and exploring a broad range of initiatives and alternatives to maximize shareholder value, giving you the opportunity to get in early, including continuation as a standalone public business, engaging with a strategic investor or acquisition, or a merger or spinoff that may involve all or part of the company's assets and possible other options as well. And Thermo also announced that pursuant to the company's 10% rolling stock option plan in compliance with the policies of TSXV it is granted set of stock options to certain directors, officers, and consultants of the company to purchase up to an aggregate of over 5 million common shares. Here's the key part. The options are exercisable for a period of three years at a price of five cents per share. So indicating that if you look at the stock today, it's trading like again, at time of filming, right around one and a half cents, you see the motivation here they're looking to do whatever it takes to get the stock price up and now you can get in at a price lower than them and it's been a great first half of 2024 this from rob fia the ceo of thermobrite in addition to the 1 million canadian and private placement capital raise we're moving forward with many of our core business initiatives including waiting for final approval from CMS on the permanent codes from the VenaWave and FDA's feedback on our 513G application for a digital cough analyzer powered by AI for life. We're pleased that our four key investment efforts are based around industries and technologies with great growth horizons and that total a market size of upwards of 39.1 billion by 2023. It's an exciting time for our team, partners, and what could be you as a shareholder but as always with any company we feature on our show no, no obligation to purchase their stock if you do your be sure to do your own research before placing any trades and with that i'm steve van meter thanks for watching thanks for being fans bye now